Could you tell us about the original aims and goals of the Academy of Ancient Music? Well, the Academy we set up in 1973 really as a um, sort of refugee operation for those players of period instruments who wanted to escape conductors and also grow into something bigger than a chamber group. And the opportunity came in 73 with the recording company, Decca, who said, let's take a risk on this and make one LP of suitably English music. It was Thomas Arne Overtures. And we met with the right number of people, and within a few days it had really worked itself into quite a fine small band. So that got the group off to a start that we thought would, if it was successful, comprise probably only Baroque music and possibly Baroque music with a slant towards the English repertoire. So it had no set aim other than to use the model of people like Gustav Leonhardt and Hanenkur abroad, who had clearly run groups on very specific Baroque repertoire. And so it was very much from the start bound up with the concept of creating a recorded repertoire that would reflect quite a lot of English musical history and the activities of the youngest and the most historically inclined players. Did many players in the original group own period instruments? In, in 73, when we started, a majority of people did actually have old instruments. They didn't own them always. They were begged and borrowed from museum collections, private collections, some private individuals. Uh, a horn player like Alan Civil, for example, was a very distinguished modern horn player, but he kept a little collection of natural horns, hand horns, to use for demonstration purposes and for lectures. And so he brought them out. There were people who collected historical percussion. Many string players in the orchestra early on also played the viol. It was an interesting and rather English makeup, I think, in that sense, that the one form of sort of domestic, authentic music that had been going on for some time had been this cultivation of viol consorts. And so the majority of the string players playing violins, violas and cellos could have put those instruments down and picked up uh, treble, tenor and bass viol if they'd been asked. And I think that set quite a bit of the early style of string playing that we employed. On the Academy's tour, they're going to be playing an all-Mozart program. How did Mozart become a specialty of the Academy? Our turning point as far as Mozart was concerned was really... Um, being asked by Decker, and on our suggestion of recording one LP of early Mozart symphonies, their reply was, why not do the complete collection? And I was never more amazed in my life, but this is what, exactly what happened. We set up a project that ran for many years, and it showed us, I think, quite a lot of, of aspects of Mozart that we had never comprehended before. It showed us particularly how Mozart worked specifically for ensembles in different parts of Europe where he was. That is, he waited till he arrived in Paris and then wrote a symphony suitable for the Parisian public and their orchestra. When he arrived in The Hague or London, he wrote for a type of band that was typical there. When he went to Italy, he wrote for a band with a great many violins in it and very few violas. When he tailored his operas for Prague like Don Giovanni, he was expecting an orchestra with four first violins and three second violins. So this concept of geography affecting the scale and sound of the music uh, was brought home to us very forcefully. During your tour, the audiences will not only be able to watch the Academy perform, they'll also be able to enjoy the supreme keyboard artistry of Robert Levin. It's been equally exciting to do a lot of work on the keyboard concertos with Bob Levin because he brings uh, two very important uh, aspects of, of music together. He's a terrific scholar, and therefore he understands the historical, geographical, organological side of things. And he is also a terrific performer. I won't put him merely as a keyboard player, but he performs at the keyboard in a way that you would... I think normally associate with a jazz musician, that is that every performance is different, um, all embellishments are completely extempore, every cadenza in the concertos is made up at that particular second for that particular audience. And if you happen to be in a recording studio, well, you take three takes of the concerto and you get three complete 
exactly uh, extempore cadenzas each time. So how much improvisation is allowable in a Mozart concerto? I think the evidence we have from Mozart's own performances covers really the complete concerto. We know that Mozart played with the orchestra, so the, the forte piano was there as a continuo instrument throughout. And being Mozart, one can speculate, I think, quite reasonably that he wasn't playing just boring chords. He was doing something a little bit more amusing and reciprocal. Then the, the written lines in the body of the concerto can be embellished and changed and varied. We know because there are several concertos where Mozart's left us with two or sometimes three versions of a passage. And then you have the standard cadenza points. Also, you have these little fermatas, pauses, particularly in rondos, before you rejoin the rondo theme where you have a little eingang, an extemporized link that will bring you back into the subject matter. We have several examples of how Mozart himself expected these to be uh, formulated, but it's such an excitement to have a performer who will always surprise you at every showing with his own interpretation of this idea. The two Mozart concertos that Robert Levin will be performing with you are the so-called Elvira Madigan Concerto, Concerto Number 21, very popular one, as well as the Concerto Number 24. I think we're playing two great piano concertos, so I think one of the things one is aiming for people to notice will be the immediate differences between this sort of performance and the regular ones that they know. I think it'll demonstrate to people what is different in way of notes in that performance. When the thing seems to have gone off the rails, they will react and know perfectly well that's a moment when Robert Levin is departing from the printed text and doing the sort of excursion that any 18th century performer would have been expected to do. During your tour, what sort of instruments will Robert Levin be playing? Uh, there'll be a number of different instruments. They'll all be forte pianos, modern copies of the sort of instruments that Mozart himself played on. Um, because of the distances we're traveling on this tour, one forte piano couldn't keep up with us all the way around and still be there in time to be acclimatized and tuned. So we'll, we'll meet several instruments some of them, I hope, resident in the halls where we play, because that means they will be balanced and relaxed. Could you explain a little more about the piano needing to be relaxed? Well, no musical instrument loves being put in a plane and taken into freezing temperatures and then dropped on the ground again and loaded into a centrally heated hall and, uh, you know, tuned hastily before a rehearsal. It will not be surprising if, after 30 minutes of playing, when the public have all come in there, the tuning has really become quite unpleasant. And rather than put people through that, I think it is much better to ask for a good resident instrument where one can find one. Another composition you'll be performing on your tour is the Clarinet Concerto, and I understand there's some fascinating history about that piece. Yes, the, the clarinet concerto is the last concerto that Mozart wrote and written for a, a strange and exciting friend of his, Stadler, who played this relatively new instrument. The problem is we no longer have the concerto as Mozart wrote it. We do have descriptions of it, and we do have a picture of the instrument now that Stadler played on, and it was not your normal... Um, a clarinet that you meet in the orchestra today. It was a, a clarinet with a, an extension in the bottom register, so it got um, several more notes at the bottom of the compass. These didn't survive into the normal orchestral model, but it's very obvious when you hear in the usually performed version of the clarinet concerto these arpeggio passages, where the arpeggio seems to be heading straight downwards and then suddenly takes a little turn up in order to land higher than it would have landed originally. Those are all symptoms, I think, of the original version using the very bottom notes of the clarinet and being able to go straight down. So with, with Anthony Pay and with the Bassett clarinet, as they, they call this instrument now, we will be playing the instrument at least with the range and with the lowest uh, notes, which are very special sounding notes that uh, Mozart would probably have expected to hear Stadler playing. We're still waiting for some Viennese widow to discover that she has the manuscript in her attic, of course. I can't believe it's completely missing, but it was given to Stadler, who then did a, a tour of Europe and claimed that it was um, either had to be pawned or was stolen from him or something to cover up the fact that when he arrived back home, he claimed not to have it any longer. 
Have there been any new developments in musicology that have altered your methods of performing Mozart? A lot of information came to light after we had done our recording of the complete symphonies. It was to do with minuets and trios, because I've always thought it was rather strange that minuets and trios were traditionally played uh, with a da capo minuet without its repeats. It always felt rather like a, a large country mansion with a small dog house attached to one side looking out of proportion and so when we came to recording these pieces I did insist on repeats throughout even on da capo simply on the grounds that Mozart didn't say senza so that bit we got right the part we were not so aware of I think was the sheer speed at which many of these minuets were intended to go we were thinking dancing minuet but in fact there was a separate category of orchestral symphonic minuet which was going at a speed comparable to the speed of later scherzos. And so we began to adopt these considerably faster one-in-a-bar tempi for minuets. And it makes a big difference, and it also gets you over the one big problem of doing all the repeats, which was that they took too long. So now we do all the repeats, and they don't take too long, and we're obeying you know, later discoveries in musical evidence for performance. So that's made quite a difference to most classical symphony performance.